Well, good Sunday morning to you. Uh, we obviously, uh, because of our internet uh, incapabilities at our church, we are pre-recording this, but uh, this will be posted on Sunday morning, and so I hope this Sunday morning for you is a, a good one. Uh, we have uh, lived through a tough week, I know this past week, and I'm not going to say a whole lot about it, uh, because uh, we as believers, even though we are obligated to, to participate in our government and be uh, obligated to our duly elected government officials, uh, we uh, also know that our kingdom is not of this world, and so our first allegiance is to our Lord and Savior. And so we can hold on to that as our, uh, as our country itself is in fear and upheaval. We do not have to be. Uh, we can rest in the fact that, uh, that our boss is still in charge and that he is taking care of us and that he has us in the palm of his hand. For the next couple of weeks at least, I'm going to be looking uh, at some things in the Sermon on the Mount beginning in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, I have hesitated to start a... Uh, a series because I do not know how long this uh, virtual church is going to last. We know that it will be at least until the end of the month. Uh, but, but I want to look specifically, I'm not really going to dig uh, as deeply as I might if I were doing a long series uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. But there's a couple of things that I want to deal with. And one of those is uh, what I'm going to really talk about tonight is how to overcome the difficulty of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, and you know what I'm talking about. If you've ever uh, spent any time at all in the Sermon on the Mount, you, you know um, the challenges that it brings to us when we begin to read all these things that says, if you're going to be uh, a follower of mine, then here's what you've got to do. And he, all of these things that he says uh, are things that I wouldn't say that they are all impossible, but I can tell you that in a day-to-day -day basis, it seems to us that it's very improbable. And the truth is that uh, I, I began, uh, as I began to think about this, and, and I've only been thinking about it the last eight or ten days, it actually came to my mind um, as I was preparing for Nikki Bennett's funeral this past week. Um, and for whatever reason, it kept coming to my mind that, that the redemption of Nikki Bennett is now complete. Uh, you know, in 1 John it says, uh, Brothers, it has not yet appeared what we shall be. But we do know that when we see Him, we will be like Him. For we will see Him as He is. So we know that we have not yet achieved perfection. Even though at near the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And it would be very possible for us to get discouraged when we begin to read uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And I want, to, I want to deal with that. I want to deal with how we overcome the difficulties of applying the Sermon on the Mount to us. And to be honest, as we read through this, uh, none of these things, there's nothing wrong with any of these things, but when we look at ourselves in the mirror, uh, we begin to think, you know, I can never perfectly uh, be non-judgmental so that I myself will not be judged. And knowing that I am the light of the world and that a city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. And so it says, let your light shine so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. That is a tough, tough challenge. That people would look at me and glorify my heavenly Father. But I want to talk about that and then I want to put it in the context of the process of learning how to live uh, by Jesus' teachings. Uh, and, and that's very important because, you know, there are a lot of people who uh, have changed the, uh, the gospel of grace and the good news of the forgiveness of sin into the gospel of kindness 
and being a good person. And, and there is a move even among the broader uh, scope of what we would call the Christian community of people who believe that simply uh, to live by the example of Jesus is all that we need to do to treat everybody, you know, as we would want to be treated and to, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. And, and we're supposed to do those things, but that is not. What puts us in proper relationship with Jesus. And, and we, as we read through some of these things, I want to, us to think about it. And, and then we're going to look, uh, after I read this section from the Sermon on the Mount, I want to go to Romans 12 for just a moment. And then we're going to compare the two. And when he saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain. This is Matthew chapter 5, by the way. When he saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it be made salty again? It's good for nothing anymore, except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under the peck measure, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. Who is in heaven. Now, the Beatitudes have always been a beautiful reading, but if we are honest, when we look at these passages of Scripture, these verses, and then we look in the mirror, we, we realize that a gauntlet has been thrown down. Uh, how often uh, do we come to the place in our lives where we realize and admit that we are spiritually poor? In other words, that we are bereft of anything that will endear us to God. Because we spend a great deal of our Christian lives trying to endear ourselves to our Heavenly Father. Uh, it is a real temptation for us to do the good works so that the Lord will see us instead of so that the world will see the Lord in us. But you see, it begins with those who admit their need for the Father, not those who admit that they're going to try their best to be like Jesus. That's where it begins. And you see, the gauntlet is thrown down immediately. That we must always and everywhere and every day come before the Lord and say, as Jesus said, I believe it was in Luke chapter 7, He said, when you have done all that you can do, you must admit that, and say to the Lord that we are unprofitable servants. We have only done that which was our duty to do. In other words, there is, it, it, is, it is only when we approach the Lord with this attitude that we belong to the kingdom of heaven. In fact, those are the only ones who do belong to the kingdom of heaven. And yet we are always fighting the battle, not necessarily of spiritual pride, but of spiritual markers. To believe that we are uh, better, not, not more holy. I mean, right here it's going to tell us, be holy just as your heavenly Father is holy. It, it's not that, but it is that somehow we are, we are 
getting more saved by the things that we do. No, the heavens belong to the spiritually poor. But you see, that's just the beginning of the gauntlet. Because it said, blessed are they who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And of course, this is talking about a spiritual mourning, I believe. It's not just those who are broken hearted over, over the grief of a lost loved one or, or grief over the sorrows of the world. But this, this is talking about a spiritual comfort for us. And again, this goes hand in hand with what he said in the previous verse, that, that, that the comfort and the salvation comes to those who are broken over their sins. And we quite often must admit that we are not very broken over our sinfulness. That we are not very mournful over our inability to, to live up to God's standard. The gauntlet gets tougher the further we go. Blessed are the gentle or the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I must confess that quite often I, I am much more ready to throttle someone than to be meek. Uh, I fight with this. I know that it, what it says here, that it is the meek who will inherit the earth. And, and I believe that's actually talking about the ultimate earth. When the Lord returns and in the kingdom, it is the meek who will make it into uh, the new heavens and the new earth. I don't believe it's just talking about this earth. But that is such a challenge and for us to think that, that in order for us to be, have our full place in God's kingdom, uh, whether it's on this earth or the earth and the heavens that are to come, that we must be gentle and meek, it's a tough battle. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. Now, I've got to ask you, when was the last time that you hungered and thirsted after righteousness? And by the way, that's ta that is talking about personal righteousness. Um, now this doesn't contradict what I said up about, about being spiritually poor. But it is the heart's desire to be not only in right relationship with God through Jesus Christ, but that we would, because our heart is changed, we are pursuing, you know, to be hungry and thirsty uh, is to desire that our righteousness be fulfilled. Uh, too often, uh, we don't have any problem with our unrighteousness. Too often, we're, we're pretty satisfied with our inabilities. But here it's, it's talking about the the desire, the deep desire. If, if you have ever actually been hungry, and I, I must confess, I've not been very hungry in my life very many times. There have been a few times when I'd love to have had a sandwich, but I wasn't starving to death. But there have been some times when I was thirsty. I can remember when, when I was uh, first started uh, in ninth grade when I got to actually practice with the varsity football team, and I thought that I was going to die before the line to the to the, uh, the Gatorade and the, and the water bucket got down to me. Uh, I have been thirsty a few times. But the truth is, remembering how that was, there haven't been very many times in my life where I really was just longing for a personal righteousness to be like Jesus uh, in my thoughts and in my actions and in my responses. The gauntlet has been thrown down to us. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Too often, we clamor for justice. It's not very often that we offer mercy to people who wrong us. It's not very often that we offer forgiveness and forgetfulness to those who do us wrong, who do us harm. It's not very often. But the truth is, the gauntlet is thrown down because it says, blessed are those who are merciful, for they are the ones who will receive mercy. And Jesus was plain about that. He said, for if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. It's tough. 
It's hard. How can we live up to it? Blessed are the pure in heart. Lord, you know. You know how hard it is for me, Lord, to be pure in my heart. Oh, I can do it out where people can see me. You know, I can, I can hide my foibles. I can hide my bad thoughts. I can hide my angers, my temptations. But it says, blessed are the pure in heart. For they are the ones who will see God. By the way, it does say, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The implication is, they and only they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. If ever a time in our world uh, was in need of peacemakers, the time is now. Not peacekeepers, just peacemakers, where conflict and upheaval is. But it's tough, isn't it? It's tough to make peace. It is tough to do, as Paul said, as much as lieth within you, be at peace with all men. In other words, to whatever extent the ball is in your court, you make for peace. It's hard. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. You know, we, we keep talking about the fact that, you know, persecution is coming because of the direction our country is heading in. That's probably true. But I can tell you that there are times that if we openly declared who and what we are in Christ, we would face a level of persecution, even if it was uh, being snubbed and passed over for a promotion. Or it might be being left out of the circle at work. Or it might be being laughed at by our schoolmates. Or it might be the not getting the date you asked for because they know that you're a goody two-shoes. And sometimes those little persecutions are harder to avoid than the overt ones. Facing and not fearing persecution and living a life that puts us in open opposition to the world's system and the world's uh, life and the world's lies. Living openly as a follower of Jesus in a world that is headed the other direction is not easy. But the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are not ashamed to claim their heavenly Father and Jesus as their Savior. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I want to say something about that as well because this, this is where we find ourselves now. You see, in a world that is rejecting the truth of God, in a world that is re rejecting salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, those who stand for Him come in a long line of those who stood for righteousness, those who stood for the truth, those who stood for salvation by grace through faith in Christ alone. And it is our opportunity, but it is also a difficult thing to stand in the face of that kind of opposition, like the prophets who before us were persecuted, by those who stood for Christ when it meant their lives. It's a hard challenge, but the gauntlet has been thrown down by generations past. 
And then, as we have considered each one of these things in the Beatitudes, just very briefly, he explains, you need to live by these principles. You need to be this kind of person because he says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how will it, the earth, be made salty again? How will the salt be made salty again? I don't believe this is talking about it giving flavor. I mean, salt flavor is one of the parts of it. But something more direct is that salt is a preservative. Salt is a savor of those things that would otherwise be corrupted. When he says we are the salt of the earth, we are the savers, the preservatives of the world. When he's naming off these things that the kingdom of heaven belongs to these people, It is no mistake that when he finishes that list, he says, guys, you're the salt of the earth, but if you lose this saltiness, how, where's the saltiness going to come from? Then he says, "It's, it's good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trodden under the foot of men. The inability or the refusal to live by these principles, to have these things in our lives, gives us, it it causes us to lose our place in the earth, in this world, as the preservatives, as the savers of the world, as the carriers of the message. And truly, Christianity as just another philosophy, or Christianity as just another religion, is worthless to be trodden under the foot of men. And well, it should be, unless it's saving properties, are active in us. But even more painful to think about, it says you're the light of the world. And a city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. In other words, we're on display for all to see. And certainly it says you don't hide your lamp when you nobody lights a lamp and then covers it with a basket. But you put it where it gives light to everybody in the house. And so he gives us a direct command here. He says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now there's something about this. It doesn't say, so make your light shine. It didn't say that, did it? What did it say? It said, let your light shine. There's two things about that. That means that we're not the source of the light. But it also means that we have to squelch it if it's not going to shine. It is not up to me to gin up the power of the light to shine into the darkness. No, John 1 tells us the light shines in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. And here he just simply says, let your light shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Which is, brings us to the whole conundrum that I, that I brought forth at the very first. How in the world can we live up to this, these standards? When it starts laying out all these things about the attitude of our heart and how we approach our lives and our testimonies and all those things and and going out into a world of conflict to be peacemakers and, and trying to shine our light into the darkness, how in the world can we possibly do that? And 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 it we'll see next week, it only gets worse from here. Except that it doesn't. 
Okay? Except that it doesn't. As I mentioned earlier, this, these thoughts began to come to my mind as I was preparing for Nikki's funeral and the fact that her redemption was complete. And there was a couple of times during the funeral that I talked about the fact that, that, her, pro, her, that her, her life had been in the process of being redeemed. She was being redeemed in, 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 when she accepted Jesus Christ as her Savior. Her process of life afterward was in the process of being redeemed. And if we consider our inability to measure up to our perfect redemption that we're going to have someday when we are like Jesus because we see Him face to face, you know, if, if that's our measure, we're going to be miserable our whole lives. Here, here's the key. We need to let our process shine before Man. You know, I believe it was C.S. Lewis that said, you know, you, you cannot compare uh, this person who claims to be a Christian and, and you look at all the stuff in their lives and then you compare him to, you know, uh, uh, Mother Teresa or somebody like that and say, well, he must not be a Christian because look at his life compared to that. But that's not the comparison. The comparison is what you were before the process started. You see, before I was without Christ and without hope in this world, but Jesus Christ, by grace and through my faith in His grace, saved me and began the process of redemption in my life. And the whole process is of me dying to the old person that I was and coming alive to the new person that I am in Christ and will continue to be. As Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, he said, it's not as though I had already attained or were already perfect, but this one thing I do, forgetting what? The things which are behind and pressing on to the things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You see, the process of redemption for us should reflect the light of Jesus. The ones who see our lives and the light that is shining from us is not the light of perfection, but it is the light of the process of redemption. To see that who I was is not who I am. And who I am is not who I will be. I want you to turn to Romans chapter 12 for just a moment. And this is the key. The first two verses of Romans chapter 12. And, and this has helped me a great deal when I wrestle with the seeming impossibilities of the Sermon on the Mount. These two verses help me. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is that which is good and acceptable and what and perfect you see the whole process of becoming a living sacrifice the life that I now live is not who I was. The life that I now live. As Paul said it best, he said, I am crucified with Christ. 
Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, in verse 2 where it says, and do not be conformed to this world, it's talking about the old imperfections that we were all too aware of. Not only the imperfections, but the impossibilities for us to live good enough to be righteous. That's the old person that we were. Conformed to the world. But it says, do not be conformed to this world, but, and I want to read this like it literally says in the original Greek language. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye being transformed. I say it that way because that's the way it's written because there's two things about it. It is passive and it is a process. Be ye being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And how is your mind renewed? By being yielding your bodies as a living sacrifice. Dying to the old person, living to the Spirit. Romans chapter 8 explains to us that, that the law of the spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death. Being conformed to the world as I was before, now by the life of the spirit in me, if I yield myself to its work, I find myself being transformed by the renewing of my mind. Romans chapter 1 tells us that when man rejected the truth of God, it says his foolish heart was darkened. And he began to worship and serve the creature instead of the Creator. But our minds are enlightened by the Spirit. The light has shined in darkness. You see, when we read the impossibilities, or the improbabilities at least, and yes, to me they seem impossible, when I read the directives of the Sermon on the Mount. And yet I know that the Spirit in me is guiding me toward those things, that I am in process, and the process of my redemption that is ongoing and will be complete on the day that I die or until on the day that Jesus returns. That process of the Spirit living in me is letting my light shine. I don't have to drum up some kind of magical formula or, or powerful testimony of for years I wandered deep in sin, but now all of the, you know, and, and some kind of testimony that makes everybody listen. It is simply letting the Spirit that is in me out into the community in which I live, the workplace in which I live, the neighborhood in which I live, the relationships that I live in the midst of. That is simply what it is. And it helps us not to be discouraged when we fail and when we come up short if we remember that the Spirit is in the process of making us like Jesus. That we have not yet attained it and we are not yet perfect. But we should be pressing toward it. You see... That's why he gave the warning. He says, you're the salt of the earth. If the salt loses its savor, the world's not going to see the true picture. There's not going to be any preservative for the world. And Christianity itself, if it loses its purpose, it will simply be trodden under the foot of men. And then he encourages us to let our light shine. Don't resist it. Don't hide it under a basket. Let it shine. It is Jesus, as the the praise team sang earlier, shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's mercy. You see, Jesus shining through us is not just the hope of our salvation but it is the light of the world that is in us. That's why he calls us the light of the world, because his light is in us. 
So as we look in broad terms at the Sermon on the Mount, do not be discouraged. Let it be the mark toward which you are pressing. Press toward being the kind of person who depends solely on the salvation of God through Jesus Christ. Be the kind of person who mourns over their sin. Be the kind of person who is a peacemaker. Be the kind of person. You know, we, we can work on those things because the Holy Spirit is leading us toward those things. And so as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, do not be discouraged by them, but be encouraged that the Spirit is leading us toward those things. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much that you have, you didn't cut any corners with us and you didn't tell any lies. You didn't come with any pretense that it takes perfection to reach heaven. And yet, Lord, you were perfect for us and in our place. And then you took our sin upon yourself and gave us your perfection in God's eyes. And then you gave us your life, your life-giving spirit to take us toward the light and the life that is eternal. And I pray, Lord, that you will help us to be encouraged to follow you with everything that we are. Because I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise, Praise Him all creatures. creatures.